Hi everyone and welcome to this tutorial where I'm going to show you five easy ways that you can make your workflow more efficient inside of Nuke. This little guy that we're looking at now is Jake Peralta the Aussie. You can follow him on Instagram here and he's going to be our test footage today that we're going to work with. So the first thing we're going to do is we're actually going to turn off these little postage stamps that you see inside of the read node. What happens by default in Nuke is as you play through the clip, you can see this node highlighting and updating the little thumbnail. And that over time with a lot of different nodes and a lot of different elements can get really, really heavy. And we don't want to worry about that at all. There are two ways that you can do this. And the first one is going into your preferences, going to the node graph section, and changing the postage stamp mode from current to static frame. And now this node will stop updating and stop using any resources, but you still get a nice little thumbnail of what the read node is. The alternative is if you double click on this and go to the node tab, you can actually turn the postage stamp off completely. However, I don't personally like doing this because I find it difficult to see what the node is sometimes, especially if they don't have good names or not very specific names. Uh, so it's a personal preference thing, but this without any thumbnail will be a lot more efficient, but static frame works just as well. And it cuts down on the resources that a read node might use. The next one that we're gonna jump to is how to optimize your rendering and dealing with things that can be pretty heavy like motion blur or just having nodes off in the script that can turn on when you render. So in this example, I have a roto shape, a circle being projected onto a card through a scanline render. It does have some animation as you can see, but there is no motion blur. If I turn motion blur on by going into the scanline to the multi sample tab and increase this to say 16 you can see that it does add the motion blur but it can be pretty heavy and pretty slow to update and if you have something that's a lot more complicated and you have something that or many of these it can get really really slow on updating your image to work with. So one thing that you can do with this that's really, really useful is you can use a very quick and simple expression that uses the dollar GUI, which if you're not familiar with dollar GUI, we'll talk about that now. So I'm gonna set the samples back to one. That removes all the motion blur. But what I'm gonna do is right click, add expression. I'm gonna type dollar GUI question mark one semicolon 16. And what it says is the result is one. What this means is while it's active in the comp, we're only using one sample, which means it's not adding motion blur, it's gonna be super light. When it gets sent to the render farm or when we submit it to render, it will use 16 samples and add that motion blur for us. So while we're working, it will be very fast and efficient, but when we render, it will give us the motion blur that we need. The dollar GUI does this on many, many nodes where you can have something inactive while you're working and active when you render. So when you've set something up that might be really, really heavy, but you don't want it bringing down the rest of the script, you can add this little expression to your node that will turn it off while you're working and turn it on when you render. You can even do this on things like the disable node which makes it inactive like so. So now it's inactive while the script is being worked on. And when we go to render it, it will be active. Uh, I do recommend you read up more on the dollar GUI or the GUI. Uh, but in this context, we're using it as a ratio to say that we only have one sample while we are comping and when we render it adds 16 samples so i've already rendered this out and we're going to look at this here and you can see that i have the motion blur and this takes us in to our next point of pre-comping everything that you can 
this will make it significantly faster. Working with a read node is significantly more efficient than working with an active comp piece like this. So by pre-comping this out, we get all of that motion blur that you can see here without any of the processing happening above. And this is gonna be very, very important when you have a lot of grade nodes, when you have a lot of effects that are happening, pre-comp out whatever you can. Don't go too crazy where you're pre-comping things four or five times. That's just a very like inefficient way of doing things because you're gonna to have to render each of those nodes every single time. But if you're separating things into their own respective zones, then you can pre-comp each of those into its own file to make it more efficient later on. So the next thing we're gonna go into here is cropping down your bounding boxes. You can see if I look at the rotor shape here, it has a nice, neat, tidy bounding box that only is the size that it needs to be. But if we look at the scan line, because it's going through a card, it's going to the format, we can see that the bounding box is the entire resolution of the image. And again, we're only using a small section here, so we don't need it to process all of these pixels. And we can do that by adding a crop, like so. And we can drag in the bounding box like this. And we're now only processing that small amount of area that we need to. But the next thing that we can do to take this one step further, I'm just going to reset this, is we can actually use a node called the Curve Tool. I'm going to disable this. And what the Curve Tool will do is it has this option called Auto Crop. And I'm going to select Auto Crop. I'm going to drag this like so. And what I'm going to do is hit Go. It's going to give me a frame range. I'm working at frames 50 to 100. I'm going to click OK. So now, if I look at the Auto Crop, what it's doing is it's giving me a bounding box based on the alpha. It's auto detecting the alpha channel, cropping the image based on that information and giving me the result. So what I'm gonna do is I'm actually gonna take this information, this data, and put it into this crop. You can click and drag and it will add it like this, but it's you can see that it's not copying all the keyframes. So what I'm gonna do is hold shift, click and drag like so. And that is going to copy over all these values and these animations and bake them into this crop node. You can alternatively hold down control and do this and it will expression link them. But in this case, we're just going to bake that animation data in, holding shift and dragging down. So now if we look at this crop, you can see that the bounding box is only the size of the shape that we need. So the next step is we're gonna actually merge this over the footage of Jake. Unfortunately, we've covered up his little face. And let's say, for example, we wanna merge this as a mask, like so. So now we just have his face. It's kind of like that James Bond intro thing, kind of rolls in, highlights his face, and there we go. And leading on from what we just talked about, about bounding boxes, is you can see that our bounding box is the full resolution once again, but we're only using this area. Now, we could crop this after, and we could take this information and do that again, or one thing that we can do inside the merge node is change the set B box option. And you can set it to union by default, which just means that it adds the two together. So the bounding box of Jake is what is giving us the 1920 by 1080. And this is being added to that. If it went outside of it and it went into this area here, if it wasn't being cropped off by the side, this bounding box would be bigger because it's the additive bounding box of the two files. You can kind of see there that it increases a little bit. But what we can do is change this to A. And now the bounding box 
takes that information that we've already been given and already cropped this to, and it crops it down to this, making it significantly faster for playback, or at least with working and if we're adding things further down the pipe. You can, of course, set this to B as well, and typically you would be working with the B pipe, and that's when you're adding things like glows or you're adding certain elements on top. They might be significantly bigger than the format that you're working to, and they can extend really, really far out. And you can set them to B to keep them down to this. But in this instance, we're going to set it to A. And it's going to take that bounding box. And now we're only processing just the pixels that we need. We're not processing, processing anything more than we need to. We're not wasting resources on any of these pixels that we don't need. And there are many, many other things that you can add to your workflow, such as, you know, they don't necessarily make Nuke more efficient, but they make you more efficient, like using backdrops and labeling things and dots, as you can see I'm using here, to just kind of keep things nice and neat. And yeah, if you have any of your own optimization workflows that you want to share, please feel free to put them in the comments below. Thank you for checking out this video. Again, make sure to follow Jake on Instagram. You can follow me on Twitter at Kid, and I will see you in the next one.